Welcome to the podcast of Grace Community Bible Church. We hope and pray that you are blessed, challenged, and inspired by this message. For other sermons or more information, visit us at gracebiblechurch.org.au. As we live in this sin-cursed world, there are many troubles that we will go through, difficulties that we will go through, that is part and parcel of living in this sin-cursed world. Yes, we recognize that God is sovereign, but sometimes God's sovereignty, his, his uh, providence in our lives can, uh, can also be difficult. And it is during those times that uh, m- more than anything else, the one thing that we would struggle with is... Uh, with regards to the goodness of God. That when we go through difficulties, one of the most common questions that pop in our minds and in our hearts is, is God really good? I mean, I know the Bible says that, but the circumstance or the season of life that I find myself in seems like God is not good. And so where do we go from there when, when we are in this kind of season of life or circumstance in life where it's difficult? Well, we don't depend on our feelings and we don't simply hope that this circumstance would go away while uh, it would be nice if the difficult circumstance would go away. But our confidence is not in our feelings, it's not in our circumstance, but it's in the Word of God. Because it is the word of God that will assure, of, assure us of things that are true and eternal and that are lasting. It is the word of God that will assure us things about God and what he is doing in this world. This passage that we are going to look at in Genesis 9 verses 8 through 17, it, it's... It deals with what's typically known as the Noahic covenant, meaning the, the, the covenant that was first established with Noah, but obviously then it goes on to the rest of creation. And what we'll see in this passage as we look at this covenant is that we will be reminded of God's character, of God's goodness toward all of his creation And it will remind us even of the fact that God is therefore going to be faithful to fulfill his purposes. That he will be faithful to his promises. Now in terms of where we're at in this passage, we saw last week that Noah had and his family had come out of the ark. And God's intention for Noah and his family is still the same as it was at the start of creation. It is to be fruitful and to multiply and fill the earth so that this whole earth will be filled with his glory. But there is a problem. Because even though God had pressed the reset button by sending the judgment of flood, and wiping away all that was corrupt, sin still remains in this world. This world is still a sin-cursed world. And so to, to protect life, and to propagate life, and to preserve human life, God says to Noah, and we saw this last week, that I will provide you with food, in fact, the, 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 the menu will further be extended, that it will not just be plants, but it will also include uh, meat. But at the same time, God says that we should be careful or not careless with killing of animals. And then on top of that, God adds that because this is a sin-cursed world and because there is evil, I'm going to restrain this evil by establishing uh, authority structures and law structures to uphold, the, uphold justice and also to restrain the animals from attacking man. 
So there is a kind of rest, a kind of respite, you would say, even from what was there before the flood that God is providing now. But this is all well and good. There's still a problem. And the problem is this, that as Noah and his sons, as they become fruitful, as as they multiply and fill the earth, they're going to have more, produce more sinful human beings. So what does that mean? Does that mean that every few years that God is going to come and send another global flood and he's going to keep doing this? Then what is the point of all this? And then beyond that, how is God going to achieve his plans and his purposes? Where he said that he would send the promised uh, offspring who would deliver his creation from the curse of sin and death. How is God going to achieve all this if he's going to keep bringing his judgment in the form of a global flood? And so in order to reassure Noah, to give assurance to Noah about who God is and about uh, God's character, God establishes this covenant with Noah and the rest of creation. And by way of outline, we are going to look at this covenant, this Noe covenant, this covenant that God makes with all of creation under two headings. To be assured even for ourselves of God's character and as a result that God will fulfill his plans and purposes and we can rejoice and be thankful in that. And so by way of outline, firstly, we'll look at the assurance in the promise of God's covenant in verses 8 through 11. And then we're going to look at the assurance in the sign of God's covenant in verses 12 through 17. So firstly, the assurance in the promise of God's covenant, verses 8 through 11. It says that then God said to Noah and his sons with him, meaning after God has given these responsibilities, uh, reiterating his purpose to go forth and multiply and fill the earth, and yet at the same time God's going to provide food and restrain evil. Having said that, then God says to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you. Now, this word covenant, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, it's a very important term in the Bible because it is through these covenants that we get an understanding of how God is working out his redemptive plan at any point in time and history. And what is a covenant? Well, in a basic sense, a covenant is nothing other than a binding promise. You could think of it like this, like a, like a contract, a, a legal agreement between two parties, whereby whatever is agreed by the two parties, it is legally binding. And there are consequences if you break it. So you can think of contracts, say, um, I don't know, building contracts or uh, other things like that. Or you could think of marriage contracts, uh, w- which whereby there are uh, these legally binding uh, covenantal relationships between a man and a wife. So this is, this is what a covenant is. And God is saying to Noah and his sons that he is going to confirm or establish the covenant that he had already spoken of in Genesis 6-8, before the flood. You see, God had every intention of fulfilling this covenant, this binding promise. Because he talks about the flood Uh, talks about this covenant before the flood. And now that the flood is over and there is sin, God is not thrown off by this in any way. He's not surprised by it. 
God is still going to carry out his covenant to preserve life as he had originally planned even before the flood. And now he's going to explain this covenant to Noah and his sons. You know, to, for God, when you think about it, it would have been enough for God to just make a promise. I mean, his word in itself would, would have been more than enough. He is God. But God goes beyond that, beyond just saying, oh, I promise to do this. I promise to preserve life. No, he goes beyond that. He says, no, this is my covenant. I'm legally binding myself in this contract and this promise that I'm making. Now notice the beneficiaries of God's binding promise. It is Noah and his sons. And as God says to them, I will establish my covenant with you, plural, as in with you all, with Noah and his sons. As I establish my covenant with you all and your offspring after you. So who's, who's this offspring after you as he speaks to Noah and his sons? Their descendants. So it's Noah, his sons, and their descendants. But who are the descendants of, of Noah's sons? Well, it's all of humanity, including you and me. I mean, it, it includes the, the young and the old, the rich and the poor, the wise and the foolish, the, the godly and the ungodly. Essentially, this covenant includes all of humanity, without exception. And it's not just for the benefit of all of mankind. Notice it also includes the animals as well. Verse 10 says, So I establish my covenant with you and your sons and uh, offspring after you and with every living creature that is with you the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. So this covenant is for the winged creatures and the birds. It's for the domestic animals, as well as the wild animals. You know, it's interesting that God reiterates this covenant where he says, and it is for every beast of the earth. Twice he says that. Meaning it is for the wild beasts as well. Yes, these wild beasts that are dangerous to man, that could threaten human life, and man may not necessarily like them because of the danger that these wild animals pose to mankind. But God says, even these wild animals, all creatures, all creatures great and small, they are going to be the beneficiaries of this covenant of mine to preserve life. So it's all of humanity and all of the animals. Now verse 11 really spells out the covenant. God says, I establish my covenant with you. And what is this covenant? That never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God is saying with this covenant, he is never going to destroy all flesh with a global flood again. That he will never again send a global flood. Now you might be saying, but didn't God say this before? Yes, God did mention this in response to Noah's offering up a sacrifice as soon as he came out of the ark. And we saw that in Genesis 8, 21 and 22. In fact, let's just look at that. Genesis 8, 21 and 22. Let me just read that. It says there, And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma... The Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Never will I ever 
Again, strike down every living creature as I have done, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. So previously in chapter 8, God said in his heart, meaning God simply spoke to himself. Now God is making this known publicly to Noah and his sons. That this is God's binding promise to preserve life, to never again send a global flood and destroy all life. Now here's the thing about covenants. In a covenant, there are two parties involved. And if the two parties are of equal stature, the, each individual party can negotiate the terms of the covenant and then agree on it, and then those terms become binding on both parties. But if you have a covenant whereby there is a superior and an inferior, like a king and a servant, which is the case here, you have the king of the universe who is God and his subjects, which is his creatures. So when there's there's a disparity between the two parties, a, 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 a king and his subjects. It is the king alone who sets the terms or the obligations in the covenant. And they are binding. And the inferior or the king's subjects can do, cannot negotiate in this. The only thing that can, they can do is, yes, I accept whatever is stipulated in this covenant. But you know what the wonderful thing is in this covenant? The recipients have no obligations. It is God alone who has the obligation and has legally bound himself to carry out this covenant, to preserve mankind and all the animals, to never again send a global flood to wipe out all flesh. God himself has unilaterally bound himself to preserve all life. So what that means is this, that this covenant is not conditioned on anything other than God himself. See, it's not like if the animals or mankind, if they're being naughty or if they're being bad, that suddenly this, this covenant is off, this agreement is off, this legally binding covenant is off. No, this, this covenant is conditioned only and solely on the goodness of God toward his creation and his faithfulness alone to keep this promise. I love that. And that's why even to this day and, and even beyond as the days keep going, that the animals from, from the sparrow to the lion, they get their food. And they have shelter and they're, and they're protected because of this covenant of God, because of God's goodness toward them in this covenant. And that's why regardless of whether somebody is a Christian or not, regardless of whether someone acknowledges God or blasphemes God or, or loves God, every human being still has air to breathe and food to eat. There is a stability of seasons. There is an assurance every day that the sun will come up. And it will light up the sky and warm the earth. The sun's not going to suddenly just drop off and fall off the sky. And the reason why the sun does this is because of God's goodness toward his creation to preserve life and to sustain life. The fact that there is a restraint of the wickedness of other people around through government institutions and through other means. This again is God's goodness toward mankind to preserve and sustain life as expressed in this covenant. You know, this is what theologians call as the common grace of God. 
In fact, some even call this, this covenant with Noah and the rest of creation as the covenant of common grace. And this grace is different from God's redemptive grace, which saves people. No, this is not that grace, but this is nonetheless God's undeserved common grace or favor towards all creation in this sin-cursed world. And it's called common grace precisely because it's God's grace shown to all of his creation without exception, without restriction, to all of mankind and to all of his creatures. So in this covenant, there is no requirement, no obligation on the part of mankind or the animals. But God, on the other hand, binds himself, obligates himself in this covenant toward his creation. To be faithful to his promise, to demonstrate his goodness toward his, cre- toward his creation, to preserve life on this earth. So what this means is when the world around us panics and says all life is going to be wiped out because the polar ice caps are melting or because of climate change where the seasons will become so crazy and all of life will be destroyed on earth or even things like Uh, you know, perhaps some large asteroid coming and hitting the earth and wiping out all of life on earth. As God's children, as, as Christians, we can be assured that this will not happen. All of life will not be wiped out like this. Why? Because God has promised that he will not destroy all flesh again till the end of time. And that is when his redemptive plans are complete. And this will happen only after Jesus returns a second time. It will not happen before that. So we can be assured of this as Christians. That in no other way will this all life be wiped out on this earth. Now, this doesn't mean, therefore, that we won't have any local floods or tsunamis or, or famines that kill people. I mean, we, we know these things happen, right? We know this to be a fact. It happens in local regions all around the world. But that shouldn't cause us to, therefore, question the, the goodness of God. I like how one theologian tried to explain this. He says, quote, when a tsunami happens, we ask, where is a good God? But when a tsunami doesn't happen, we usually fail to thank him for restraining us from the devastations of a world that is in rebellion against God. See, one of the things that, end quote, one of the things that we shouldn't, forget is that we are not perfect. We are not sinless. See, God sent the flood of judgment because of sin that was deep rooted in mankind, in every human being. And God demonstrated his justice toward sinners this way by sending a global flood. But even after the flood, God himself says that man is still sinful from his youth. From the time he's a babe, he is still sinful. This is true of every human being. All of us still are sinful. So what we then rightly deserve from a holy and just God who is too pure to wink at sin is his judgment. This is the only thing that we rightly deserve from God and nothing else. But with this covenant, 
that God has made. God is demonstrating to Noah, his family, and to all of mankind, including you and me, that God is not only just, but he is also gracious. That he shows his undeserved favor to all of his creation on a daily basis, even though man continues to be sinful. See, just as God's judgment was universal, where he sent a global judgment of flood, why? Because all of mankind was sinful. So now after the flood, because man is still the same and is is still sinful, God's preservation of life is also gonna be global. It is also gonna be universal, why? See, because if it were not for this covenant, God would still have to keep sending global judgments, global floods to wipe out life every few years. So this covenant is God's undeserved favor and grace toward his creatures. But so often we forget this common grace of God, don't we? I mean, the life that we have, the food and shelter and and weather and security and every other goodness that we experience from God's hand, we forget that it is undeserved. And I think, you know, one of the reasons why we forget that all of this is God's undeserved grace toward us and his goodness toward us is precisely because it is common grace. Because it is found everywhere. You see, from the time that we were born, even to this day, we experience this common grace from God. We see this around, and everyone around experiences the same undeserved grace of God every single day. Every generation, in fact, experiences this. Even the animals, big and small, they experience this grace of God every single day. And so because this grace is so common, and on top of that, there is no obligation on our part to do anything, whether we recognize God's grace or goodness, There's no obligation on our part. God will still show his common grace to us. And because of that, because it is so common and we have no obligations on our part, you know what we do? Therefore, we take it for granted. So much so that we think, yes, I'm not a good person. I, I know that. I know I'm sinful. But surely I still deserve some of these things, right? I mean, we deserve life. We obviously deserve food. We deserve shelter. We deserve security and and, and freedom and every other common grace given by the hand of God. You see, when we think this way, the point that we're missing is that the only thing that we deserve because we are holy, because we are sinful, and God is holy and just. The only thing, therefore, that we deserve is God's judgment. The global flood that God sent to wipe out all life should always be a reminder of what we actually deserve. And yet, Because of his goodness, God shows his undeserved common grace toward us and all of creation in this binding covenant where God alone obligates himself to fulfill this promise. Oh, how good God is toward us, isn't he? On a daily basis, whether we recognize it or not. Oh, how gracious God is toward us on a daily basis. 
I'm sure even Noah would have thought of how good God was being toward him and the rest of creation as he heard these words. And what an assurance this would have been to Noah and his family, knowing that they're still sinful. We now move from the assurance in the promise of the covenant to the assurance in the sign of the covenant. The assurance in the sign of God's covenant, verses 12 through 17. Verse 12. And God said, This is a sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. This is the sign of the covenant. What's a sign? A sign is a a, a distinct mark or a token or or a seal that makes the covenant valid. It's, it's, you could say that it, it's a physical mark or a sign uh, that, that marks out the covenant. In the Bible, God gives various signs for his covenants. With Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, it was circumcision. With Moses, the, the Mosaic covenant, it was observing the Sabbath day. And for the church, It's the ordinances, that is, uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper. They serve as signs of the new covenant. And so for the Noe covenant, the covenant with Noah and his family and all of creation, God also gives a sign. And as though God's word weren't enough. I mean, on top of that, he says, no, this is going to be a covenant where God himself God himself obligates himself and no one else needs to fulfill anything on their part. And if that wasn't enough, now God stamps his seal on the covenant. He attaches a a, a sign to further guarantee and certify that, that this is a valid covenant. It's going to be perpetually valid. It's going to continue to go on. And this is my sign to prove that this covenant will go on. And what is the sign of God's covenant with all of creation? Verse 13. God says, I have set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Now, what is this bow in the cloud? It's a rainbow, right? The wonderful display of various colors shaped in the form of an arc as light refracts or or bends as it passes through the the water particles in the sky. That's what a rainbow is, that that colorful, you know, multicolored arch-like thing in the sky. But you know what the interesting thing is? The word here for bow in the original is actually not rainbow. It's actually the word bow, as in bow and arrow. Notice what God is saying here. He says, I have put my bow in the cloud. See, when God speaks of the the clouds and the rain, he doesn't say, my rain, my clouds. But he does say, my bow that I have set in the sky is the sign of my covenant. And in the Bible, God is pictured as a warrior who defeats his enemies with a bow and a quiver that is full of arrows. Look at Deuteronomy 32, 23. It says, God speaking, I will heap disasters upon them. I will spend my arrows against them. Psalm 7 verse 12. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. 
Psalm 18.14 says, And he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He flashed forth lightnings and routed them. And then in Habakkuk 3, 9 through 11, it says, speaking of God again, you strip the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows, and you split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and wreathed, the raging waters swept on, the deep gave forth its voice, it lifted its hands on high, the sun and moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped at the flash of your glittering spear. So in the Bible, the imagery of God's bow and arrow is the image of God's judgment. So in Genesis 9, 3, when God says that he has set his bow, or where God says, my bow that I have placed in the sky, what God is saying is this. Now that I have used my bow and brought judgment to the world in the form of a flood, I am now going to put my bow away. In other words, God is going to set aside his judgment. One theologian said it this way, quote, the bow that was pointed toward the earth is now pointed away from the earth. See, God's bow is now hung high up in the clouds and it's set aside. Divine judgment has been put away. And what's the point of this sign? Verses 14 and 15. God says, When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. Notice it is God who brings the clouds. And when the storm clouds appear, the bow will almost certainly appear as well. The bow comes after the dark stormy clouds appear. Oh, this would have been something for Noah and his family. See, because it, think about it, for Noah and his family, if God had not told them about this covenant and the sign of his covenant, every time they saw the storm clouds, they would be thinking, oh no, God's judgment is coming. Take cover. Let's rush into the ark. It would have been petrifying for them. Every time the rain started falling, the beginning of the raindrops would absolutely terrify them if it weren't for this covenant and sign that God is telling them. But now, storm clouds, lightning bolts, torrential rain no longer means that the world is in danger. Why? Because God's bow has been set aside in the sky. And it is a reminder to Noah and his family of God's promise to show grace toward all of his creation. Now, while the rainbow in the clouds is a reminder for all mankind of God's covenant of common grace, It's interesting that the sign of the rainbow is actually meant primarily for God. Notice verse 15 again. It is God who says, I will remember my covenant. Now, what does it mean that God remembers? We saw this in Genesis 8.1, where it said that God remembered Noah and all uh, who were there in the ark with him. And we saw that 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 God remembering, it has the idea of that God is going to act toward a particular person or a people 
and most times in a favorable manner. That's a focused action of God toward a, a particular person or people at a particular time. So it's not God forgetting and needing a reminder in the form of a sign. No, th- this is God remembering. Uh, it's saying that God will be active, that he will act instead of being passive in upholding this covenant that he will continue to act in such a way to be loyal to his covenant promise to preserve life. Now let me ask you something. Does God need a reminder to be faithful to his promise? No. (laughs) He's God. He doesn't forget anything. He doesn't need reminders. So then why is this sign given? See, because knowing that God is saying through this sign that he will actively or proactively withhold judgment and continue to preserve life of undeserving sinners, this would serve as a great assurance to Noah, his family, and every other human being that they don't have to be afraid. That they don't ever have to be afraid that God will go back on his word. The sign of the covenant was assuring man that God would be faithful to keep his promise. Now verse 16 and 17. God says, when the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. Did you catch what God says there? He said, when when the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant. I love that. Absolutely love that. See, because despite man's ongoing sinfulness, God in his forbearance now no longer sees all the sin in the world. No, God in his forbearance is choosing to see his bow that he has set aside in the clouds rather than the wickedness of mankind. He's choosing to relent from sending his judgment and preserve life on earth. And God will do this till the end of redemptive history when he has accomplished all of his purposes. And so the the bow really that is set in the sky, it points to the glory of God and the character of God as well. Because in one sense, it reminds us of the justice of God and his attitude towards sin. That's his bow there that's in the sky. And in another sense, because this bow has been set aside, it also points to the grace of God. The bow reminds us of God's glory, his goodness, in that he is both just and gracious. He is both righteous and merciful. And, and, and moving forward now, the, the future of all creation, including all the families of the world, is now rooted slow, solely on the character of God. That God, because of his goodness, because of his grace and his faithfulness, he will accomplish all that he has promised to do. And as he does that, he will continue to preserve life. It is solely based on God's character. And for that, this can bring bring us great assurance too. Because God's character never changes. And he will never go against his word. Now verse 17, God sums it all up and, and essentially says, repeats himself 
where he says to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. This is God's goodness. His undeserved common grace shown to all flesh that is on the earth. And in this way, God is now going to advance his plan of redemption to bring about the promised offspring who would crush the head of the serpent and even remove the curse of sin and death from this world. And you know the fact that all flesh is repeated so many times? That man and all animals and all the earth is, is part of this covenant? as God plans to advance his uh, plan of redemption, it is significant. See, because as much as man sinned, it affected all of creation. And we saw that in the first two, three chapters of uh, Genesis. And we saw why, you know, why it affected all of creation, because man was meant to rule over his creation. And so everything else under his domain also bore the curse. Man was meant to rule over his creation by reflecting God's image and fill the earth with his glory. And because man sinned, everything under his domain was also bore the effects of the sin and the curse. So there's an intricate connection there. And so what that means is not only when man sinned, it affected all of creation, that when God redeems mankind, creation will also be redeemed. And that's what we read in Romans 8, 22, 23, where it says that all of creation is groaning along with God's children as they, as they wait to be redeemed, as they wait for the coming of the Lord. So as mankind will be free and redeemed and, and freed from the curse of sin and death, God will also ultimately redeem all of his creation, including all of the animals, when he creates the new earth. And so with the Noah covenant, what it does is this. It ensures the stability of nature. There's an order in the world where evil is being, rest is being restrained and human life can go on and flourish. So it provides a world that would not be essentially wiped out every few years. The Noe covenant provided a stable foundation whereby God's plan of redemption could be played out. See, because after the Noe covenant came the Abrahamic covenant, where God promised to Abraham that he would be a great nation and all the nations of the world would be blessed through him. Now, at that time, there was enough sin in the world for God to wipe out the world again, to kill all flesh again. But because of the Noahic covenant, God doesn't do that. And his plan of redemption keeps moving forward. And God's ongoing plan to redeem mankind and to fill the earth with his glory then leads to the Davidic covenant where then God promises an everlasting king who would come from the line of David to rule over the earth with, in righteousness and, and peace would reign and all his enemies would be vanquished and this everlasting king would establish an everlasting kingdom. And when God promised this covenant, even then there was enough and more of sin for God to wipe out the earth, but God doesn't because of the Noah covenant. So then God's plan, redemptive plan moves forward. And then in the new covenant, 
where through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God now provides a way for sinners to be forgiven of their sins, to be made right with God and be transformed from the inside out through his Holy Spirit. So this is what God's plan is, to restore mankind from every nation to a right relationship with him and to redeem all of creation in the process so that all the world will be filled with the glory of God. That's God's ultimate plan. And so in this way, the Noahic covenant provides a stable foundation of preservation of life to bring about his redemptive plan. Now I wonder if there's anyone listening today who is not a Christian. Friend, having listened to God's word today, can you not understand that every single day in every single moment, you experience the common grace and goodness of God. The fact that you are living and not dead, even though you reject God and you don't want to submit to him, the fact that you're still alive and breathing, this is God's grace and goodness toward you. But let me tell you that even though you stand guilty before God, oh, this God has shown more and more of his grace and mercy. See, because the bow of judgment that was turned away from his creation, that was turned away from this earth, that was turned again thousands of years after this covenant toward Jesus Christ, the perfect, righteous one, the beloved Son of God. Where God emptied his entire quiver, all of his arrows, his whole wrath and justice was meted out on Jesus Christ as he was crucified on that cross for guilty sinners like you and me. But you know, Jesus rose on the third day. He didn't remain dead. Because he was God, he was able to bear the full wrath of God. And so he rose on the third day, providing a way by which sinners like you and me can be made right with God. This rainbow, it appears a few other times in the Bible. It appears in Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 28. And then again, you see this in Revelation 4 verse 3, where you see this, the the rainbow surrounding the throne of God as God prepares to bring about judgment. And the rainbow in both these scenes, in in Ezekiel's vision and the vision in uh, Revelation 4.3, is a reminder that the God of all creation, he has a plan to reveal his glory on this earth. This earth which is now preserved by the sign of the rainbow. So that means God's judgment will never be global until God's redemptive plan has come to an end. And it's that, at, at that right in the end where it has become time to restore all things. 
all of creation back to himself. Until that time, there will not be a global judgment of any sort. So this time that we have now, this is the time of God's grace and God's forbearance. And where he continues to show daily his common grace to everyone around, even those who blaspheme him. And God has shown his grace particularly by crucifying his son on that cross. So friend, if you're not a Christian, today is the day to turn to Jesus Christ. You see, because once Jesus returns, if you, continue, if you have continued to reject him, you will then, that day when Jesus returns, you will come under the just wrath of God. The God who is holy and just and who cannot tolerate sin in his sight. So while there is still time, turn to Jesus. Believe in him and what he has done. And if you say you believe, then turn from your sin, turn from living yourself, for yourself, and turn to Jesus and continue to do this every single day, for this is the evidence that you truly believe in him. Now, friend, if you'd like to know more about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to follow Jesus, then you can email us at connect at gracebiblechurch.org.au and we'd love to speak to you more. But do not delay. Think about the grace of God that has been shown to you and there is still time for you to turn to him. Now, for those of us who are Christians, oh, let us eagerly wait for the return of Jesus, as God continues to fulfill his plan of redemption, no matter what we see around us, God is still fulfilling his plan of redemption as he is gathering a people from every tribe and nation to himself, even to this day. And while we eagerly wait for his redemptive plan to come to a conclusion, Let us then continue to give thanks and praise to this God of ours who has shown his undeserved grace and mercy to us every single day. And most of all, the way he has shown his undeserved grace and mercy through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's worship him and let us thank him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that Although you are just and righteous and you will not tolerate sin and you will never let sin go unpunished, you are still gracious, more gracious than we can ever imagine. You are still good to us, more good than we can ever imagine. And you have shown so much mercy to us on a daily basis and even through our our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. For this we are thankful, for this we praise you, and help us to live each day recognizing your your undeserved grace and mercy toward us and live in light of your ways. We pray all these things in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen.